Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us here today. Uh, we are going to cover processing complex workflows in advertising using Hadoop. Uh, my name is Bernardo Tiabra. I'm here today with Rahul Ravindran, and we are both in the data team at Bright Roll. Um, and our team deals with all big data related projects uh, in the company. And more recently, the data processing pipeline that we are here today to, to present some of the aspects and challenges we had to deal with. Um, and Rahul will uh, cover some of that on the second part of the presentation. In the first part, I'm um, going to talk a bit about the, uh, what Brightroll does and what the company is about. It's just going to be setting some context uh, around what we do, what kind of data we collect, and, and, and the, the scale numbers that we deal with. Uh, then I'm going to cover some of the data consumer requirements. Who are, who are the consumers of data? what kind of data we expose, and uh, some of the requirements of that data. Um, then we are moving to the motivation of building uh, this data processing pipeline. Uh, we had a legacy pipeline that was built uh, a while ago, and uh, I'm going to cover some of the drawbacks uh, of that pipeline and uh, how those drove the requirements and design of the new data pipeline. So in the design phase um, a portion, we'll, we'll be covering how we stream log data into HDFS and how we organize the events, uh, as well as some of the steps on the processing side, such as event deduplication, how we do processing based on configuration uh, settings, as well as an auditing system that uh, guarantees some level of data integrity. And then finally, we'll cover the future of uh, the data processing pipeline at Bright Roll, what we want to build, and the features we want to add. So Bright Roll, um, we are uh, the largest online video advertisement platform. Uh, what that means is we build technology to automate uh, video advertising globally. Um, we don't do any of the video creative content um, authoring. We simply provide advertisers with tools to run their campaigns, do all sorts of targeting on their campaigns, such as geo, time of day, population, any sort of um, parameters you can think of. Uh, we, we cover a lot of those. And globally, because we have a, a pretty wide reach, within the US, we reach more than 50% uh, of the audience. Um, it's about 168 million uniques every month. Uh, that means uh, we have a, a big volume of requests coming in on a daily basis, around 1.5 billion. That translates into 3 billion video ads shown every month and 20 plus billion events processed per day. It's a, th these are sort of the scale numbers that we are dealing with at, at Bright Roll at this point. And if we draw the trending graph, it has been increasing dramatically. And uh, I'll cover some of the, that scale needs on the, that went into the design of the new data processing pipeline. So we have uh, a few different consumers uh, of data at, at Bright Roll, and they process different data for different purposes. Some of the Results that come out of the processing pipeline include campaign delivery, things such as how many impressions or how many ads have I shown within a time period, uh, how many clicks resulted on, on, those, on those ads shown, and all sorts of metrics that inform uh, an advertiser on how well their campaign is doing, so the health of their campaign. Then we also uh, expand that to include broader uh, set of data for analytics purposes. And we also include telemetry data uh, that is constantly monitoring the, the health of the uh, platform in general um, over time. Then in terms of who consumes uh, these data sets, there's a very wide range of consumers from systems to individuals. 
real people consuming this data, humans. Um, so, okay. Uh, we switch to yellow. Um, so there is a, one of the consumers delivery algorithms that uh, have to do decisioning in real time. Meaning we have a, an array of servers that are constantly getting requests uh, for ads and we have to do decisioning real time. And because of the, the constraints there on 100 millisecond response time and how fast we have to do the decisioning, these systems uh, are more or less stateless. What that means is we need to feed back uh, the computer data back into the, the, the algorithms to rectify uh, the delivery and make sure that we deliver uh, on target. Another consumer of, of data is a real person campaign managers. And these are people that are managing campaigns uh, for our customers or our end customer managing their own campaigns. And uh, they need to uh, be able to monitor the health of their campaigns more or less in, in real time or close to real time as possible. So they can tweak and adjust uh, their, their targeting or their volume or their spend in order to be able to meet the, the client's uh, demands. In addition to that, we also have a billing system. Uh, that means all the data we process in the data processing pipeline is the source, source of billing. Uh, for the entire company. So you'll see in the, the requirements that uh, we had to take were processing data sort of in a low latency fashion, but in an accurate fashion. Um, some of that data also flows into forecasting and planning tools, as well as um, business analysts uh, that use their own tooling to consume this data for long and short term analysis. So as you can see, these last two points, uh, the, the correctness of the data is not as important, and these were a different set of requirements that we had to fulfill. So like I mentioned before, there was a legacy data pipeline, and the motivation uh, to, to move away from this legacy data pipeline to the new one encompasses a, a, a bunch of different points. Uh, this pipeline was built about four years ago. Uh, back then we were doing one billion requests per month on the platform. Uh, we are currently doing 45 billion per month, so it's a 45x increase over the period of uh, three years, three or four years. And of course, the, the design for that pipeline wasn't uh, done in a way that would allow us to scale forever. So that was a, a very big motivation to move away from, from the old data pipeline or the legacy data pipeline. And we wanted to make sure that the new one would be linearly scalable. Um, as volume increases, you wanna have very low cost into expanding your capacity and being able to handle more traffic. Also for a capacity planning purpose, um, it's very useful when systems uh, scale horizontally or linearly in our case, because it allows you to uh, have a, a better prediction model on how much hardware you have to purchase, on how big your cluster has to be to, to answer the, the business needs. Um, the uh, old, or the legacy data pipeline uh, had the unit of processing being a campaign. What that meant was, if you see, uh, imagine an array of servers crunching data, uh, each task was at the granularity of a, a campaign. That means if that campaign was delivering a high volume um, advertisement um, and lots of traffic, we would be constrained on having one single task to be processing that entire data set. So it wasn't as linearly scalable uh, as we wish it to be. Uh, of course, it wasn't HA. The system was homegrown with message passing um, custom built um, processing jobs, and it, com it was composed by a lot of different moving parts, uh, which made it very hard to, to monitor, to manage, and uh, especially when there was a, a, a fire or some sort of failure, it was hard to recover and require a lot of manual intervention and monitoring and uh, 
and babysitting uh, at some level to, to recover from that failure. Um, on top of that, uh, because it was custom built in-house, there was a lot of boilerplate code that we, we wrote and uh, that made it really hard to onboard new data sets or add new computations uh, to the pipeline, uh, which when you are in an evolving business, you wanna make sure you shorten the, the time uh, that you have or you need to, to add a new data set that is now being produced or drive a new computation and new metric that from the data that you already have. So we, we had to take all of this into consideration on the new pipeline. Um, another big scale cons uh, constraint was the fact that we were interval-based uh, processing on the old data pipeline and that meant we had to process a two hour window, a uh, sliding window, and that of course uh, gives you an inherent delay on how fast you can get data from producer to consumer. And if you're doing interval based processing, there are going to be times where your systems are idle until the next interval kicks in. And you'd see systems going to a high uh, percentage of uh, resource utilization for 10 minutes or so. And for the next five minutes, we were just idle waiting for the next interval to come in so we could then do the, the, the next batch of processing. And finally, um, there was uh, the necessity for all the data to arrive into the data store for us to be able to process that data. We couldn't process it incrementally necessarily. So uh, that, that caused a lot of issues when one single data producer, for example, amongst hundreds did not send the data for whatever reason. Um, and going back to the failure scenarios and manu manual intervention, that was a, a big bottleneck there. So in terms of performance requirements, um, I, I touched on some of these already, but just to reemphasize, we needed low end-to-end -end delivery of aggregated metrics, uh, meaning time of event produced till event being consumed on, on the end of the pipe, on the exhaust side, we wanted it to be as low as possible. And this was to enable the feedback loop into the decisioning algorithm on the ad serving side, as well as to give campaign managers uh, a way to react faster to the health of their campaign so they can do adjustments as needed. And of course, uh, being linearly scalable, as I mentioned, our uh, growth rate has been very, very steep, and we wanna make sure that the bottleneck is not on the code, on, on the design and the architecture of the pipeline, uh, but on how many resources or how much resources you have allocated to do processing. So with that in mind, we took some uh, design decisions when planning this pipeline. So we wanted to go into a, a streaming-like model. Uh, as I said before, um, we had to do interval-based processing. We waited for an interval to kick in, we processed that data, all the data had to be there so we could uh, process it. In this model, we wanna make sure that we process data as data comes in. So uh, it's not true streaming in the sense of storm, for example, but uh, it's very close in the sense that you don't have to do interval-based um, processing. And of course, we wanna make sure that we went over the data only once um, reading and writing in HDFS is expensive, as we all know. Um, usually, we, we run on spindle disks, and you wanna avoid that cost as much as possible. And to allow the, the continuous processing model that we, we created, we added the checkpointing concept into processing, so you know exactly where you are in the stream of data that you are processing, and when you are done with that stream, with, with that portion of the window, you process the next one, the next one. So you're continuously processing as data arrives. Um, and we wanted to decrease the low, uh, the decrease the end-to-end -end, uh, latency between event creation and event consumption. And currently we, we brought it down to about five minutes. On top of that, I, I mentioned that we do financial calculations and we are source of, of billing uh, for the entire company. So we wanna make sure that our data was correct. And in order for us to, to be correct and resist the failures and not do anything too complex, we wanna make sure that every single run of any single job in the pipeline was idempotent. That means a job can fail, a task can fail, or we can kill a job 
and we run it, and we always get the same data in the end. We want to make sure that was very robust, again, for the financial needs. And finally, to ease the onboard of new data and computations, we want to make sure that uh, these were defined in a configuration file. Uh, data is all defined in protocol buffers, so we have um, all of the event types and the fields and so on defined in a protocol buffer, which allows us to do scheme evolution much easier. Um, and we also trigger computations on, based on joins of events uh, within the same session, and we define all of that within a configuration file. Rahul will go over the details uh, very shortly on those. So in terms of a uh, general overview of, of the pipeline, um, we have data producers. In our case, uh, it's mostly ad servers that are producing data, making decisions, and uh, informing uh, the pipeline of the decisions that were made. Uh, we ingest those uh, events via FluMNG. Um, those events get written into HDFS. Files roll on a two-minute basis, and um, that's our permanent store. And then we have a series of steps um, on the pipeline. Uh, the, the deduplication, we want to make sure that all events are unique, and we then process those events and store. Those boxes are very abstracted. There's a lot more under those covers. Uh, but to simplify the diagram, that's more or less uh, what, what happens on the pipeline. And this runs on top of MapReduce, HBase, and of course HDFS. And the exhaust then fits into a data warehouse system where we store the uh, result set, the, the aggregated results. These are stored within minute level granularity up to a few days of expiration, and then they get rolled up to, to daily levels as well. So as I mentioned, the, the data flows into HDFS via FlumeNG. So we have ad servers that are constantly writing uh, data into Flume and we store that data into HDFS. And to be true to the stream-like model, what we do is um, we have the files to be rolled every two minutes. It's a feature that Flume supports uh, natively. And we make sure the files are lexicographically ordered. That means if you sort them lexicographically, you know who, which file is older and newer. And then you can do processing based on, on, on that and that ordering. And that, that is important because we implemented a, a checkpointing system, like I mentioned earlier, that we call markers, where we keep track where we are uh, in the file listing and we always move forward on our processing. So uh, an example of how a marker would look like, you see you go into a folder in HDFS, you see files that are lexicographically sorted that Flume is rotating every two minutes and all we do really is to keep a marker on that directory on which file is being processed right now. So we ingest that file and any files that have been, uh, that have been um, added after uh, the last run and we process that set of files. Once that processing is done, we then move forward the marker into the next file and that feeds into the next run of that same job. So that's pretty much how our uh, file-based marker system works. And with that, I'm going to pass the uh, talk to, to Rahul that's going to go over more details of markers and the processing side. Thanks, Bernardo. Um, so we've already seen how Flume essentially takes a bunch of files that are generated by ad-serving machines and writes them as a sequence of files into HDFS. Uh, we need to dedupe these events because a lot of events may be retried as part of Flume, and we may have um, duplication of events because of an auditing system that I'm going to go into towards the end of the presentation. So uh, before we get into the deduping algorithm, let me go over the anatomy of an event. Every event has two parts, an event header, which is common for all events, and an event payload, which is specific for the event type. The event header has an event ID, which is a globally unique identifier, which is generated at the point of uh, uh, the event generation, so in the ad serve machine, the event timestamp, which represents the time when the event was generated, the event type, and the machine ID, that is the ID of the machine where the event was generated. These um, events are now written into HDFS, and we now load these raw logs written into HDFS into an HBase table. 
We also treat the HBase table as a stream. So we're not always going over how we treat a sequence of files written, in, written by Flume as a stream with a marker. So think of this as a socket marker, as an example. Uh, we also treat an HBase table as a stream. The way we do this is because HBase provides a, a view of time, of the dimension of time, into the data that was inserted into HBase. Every cell that is stored into HBase, as you guys know, has a timestamp associated with it. So you can query based on time, all the data that is inserted prior to a particular time, after a particular time, point in time, or in a particular time interval as well. So we have a marker for every table, in fact, a pair of markers. For every HBase table, we keep a pair of markers represented by start time and end time. Start time represents all the data that was loaded into an HBase table, after, after which we need to read uh, or process this data. So all the data that, is, that was inserted prior to start time has already been read and processed. End time represents the point in time up to which we have inserted data into HBase. So all the data that, is, uh, that has been written into HBase will, be, you know, uh, will have a timestamp which is less than the end time. So as we insert more data into HBase, we move the uh, end time marker forward. As we read and process more data, we move the start time marker forward. So now we have essentially a window of data, to a window of to be processed data, which represents all the data inserted between start time and end time. Uh, now, before we go further, let me go into how we, the historical context of how we arrived at this deduping algorithm. Initially, our very naive approach to deduplication was we essentially would insert an event ID as a row key into HBase, and the event as the, as the payload in the cell. For every event that came in, we would essentially check, did the event ID exist in HBase? If it did exist, then this event that we are processing is a duplicate. If it didn't exist, we emit it. It's, it's unique. Uh, this, uh, however, required for every event a uh, random lookup into the space table. And this lookup involved the entire key space. This, each of these event IDs were globally unique, so you, the duplicate could exist anywhere. This was slow. At the scale we were talking about, this was just not going to work very well. We needed to convert this random lookup, which involved the entire key space, into a much more targeted lookup, which uh, we would look up only on a particular subsection of the data in the space table. So the way we did that was first uh, convert the row key. We would have the event timestamp as a prefix in the event ID. Now, timestamp, of course, has a, has a property that it's always monotonically increasing, and this could result in hotspotting. All the data that was inserted, you know, what, that was generated recently in the past one hour would all largely go to the same region server in HBase or the same machine. So we're not really using all the scale and the distributed nature of Hadoop if we just went about inserting uh, data using the event timestamp as a prefix. So to allow for better distribution of data across all the machines that, were there, that was uh, in our cluster, we essentially put a one byte salt, which was a hash of the event ID. This ensured that you know, the data was distributed across all the nodes in the cluster. We then take this, um, we have this window of to be processed data. We break this window of data into chunks. Each chunk has a property which is defined by all the data in a particular chunk has the same salt, and all the data in the chunk has contiguous timestamps. So this is an example here. We have the first chunk, which are, which are the first three rows here. They all have the salt value of four, and the timestamps are contiguous. The second chunk has a different salt value, and the third chunk has a, has a different salt value of seven. Each of these chunks are processed independently. Now. Of course, all the data within each chunk is also sorted. This is an artifact of how HBase stores data. It, all the data is so, uh, sorted based on the row key. Now, we then would go and for each such chunk, we would generate a secondary scan, which I call a historical scan. So this historical scan did not have a time range. The previous one was always, uh, the previous scan that we just dealt with involved scans between start row and end row. So we, we are using the property of HBase to provide a time range and a time view into the data. This secondary scan that we're generating, which is the historical scan, did not do this. It was just uh, a scan which in used a start row and end row. The start row was specified using uh, the row key as follows. The first row in a chunk was used as the start row. The last row in the chunk was used as the end row. So now we've essentially generated a new scan which did not use time, but limited the query space. The original query space, which was used for, uh, say, the first naive deduping, deduping algorithm, was going to use a, you know, have the entire key space. 
for the secondary, for this historical scan, we, given that we've used the start row and end row, we have limited the scan and the query paid into a very targeted and small section of the data. That's essentially between start row and end row. Now, at this point, we can perform deduplication, which is the obvious algorithm here, where we, for every, every row that is contained in the chunk, we would check, did that row exist in the historical scan? If it did, it's a duplicate. We don't emit it. Otherwise, we emit it. This really resulted in a dramatic improvement in our performance of deduping, given that um, we have a lot of requirements around uh, high performance here. We are at this point uh, deduping at about 1.2 million events per second, of course, amortized in a given MapReduce run. Um, one of the interesting things we noticed was we have two kinds of scans, which kind of conflict in their performance requirements. We have the time range scan, which is the scan from start, start time to end time, and we have the start row, end row based scan. The time range scan performs very well when you have a large number of H files. An H file, for people who don't know, is the underlying storage mechanism we use within HBase. So uh, each H file has metadata containing the time range of the data inserted within, uh, in contained within that H file. So if you have a large number of H files, uh, and we specify a time range uh, for the query, the start time and end time, most of the H files are eliminated as candidates. So the time range scan performs very well when you have a large number of H files. On the other hand, we have a start row and end row base scan, which is a historical scan. This will need to go, uh, go over all the H files to check whether any row existed within that particular H file. This, is, this doesn't perform as well as the number of H files keeps growing. So we have essentially two very uh, contradicting um, viewpoints in terms of performance. So what we did here was um, we, um, we, we essentially wrote a coprocessor, a compaction coprocessor, which would select all the files, the H files, which are older than start time. So now the time range scan, which always scanned data which was between start time and end, end time, would uh, perform very well at, because the number of H files in this, uh, in this time range was large. The historical scan, which would always look for data which is older than start time, would take advantage of having small number of H files and potentially a giant H file. Uh, which, would, and which would perform very well. So essentially we have two indices on H files, on H base. One is a very coarse index on time, which is based on the number of H files, and the other is, of course, the row key based uh, index, which is contained within each H file. This again dramatically helped in our performance because before we had this coprocessor, there were times when after a major compaction, we would have a time range scan taking uh, an order of magnitude more than what it would take before the uh, major compaction. So now we have a deduped uh, stream, essentially, and we need to process this to generate a lot of useful business metrics that uh, um, analysts and our campaign delivery mechanism uh, can consume. So we have uh, one of our most common uh, financial computation that we need to perform is joins. We have a lot of event types, and we need to perform arbitrary joins between variety of event types. Each event type has sub, uh, event subfields, and we need to perform joins uh, you know, based on subfields. And a very common type of join, at least in our system, is a uh, join between the impression event and an auction event. An impression event and an auction event results in you know, a financial computation, which calculates revenue numbers and a bunch of other financial data. Now, uh, we have a lot, a lot of such joins. At current counts, it's upwards of 25, and it's going to go grow dramatically over the next few months. So we needed a mechanism to onboard new joins easily. What we did was we defined all the joins based on the event types and the event subfields in a configuration file, and we had a very generic view of essentially performing any kind of arbitrary joins. So we, we used an algorithm which was very similar to the dedupe algorithm that I just mentioned. It's almost identical except for the fact that the historical scan is no longer looking for duplicates, or no longer no looking only for duplicates, but also looking for uh, the other event types that make up a join. So essentially, in the time range scan, if, there's, if the last event type that shows up for a join would trigger a computation. Uh, the historical scan uh, would also perform business level deduplication. It's very common, especially in, in uh, uh, ad fraud scenarios where you have some kind of client which is hitting the same impression URL multiple times. The ad serving machine would generate different event IDs for each such impression uh, URLs but they all are uh, impressions for the same auction, so it needs to be counted only once. So we need to perform deduplication not based on event IDs, but based on an auction ID. And we performed that in a manner which is very similar 
to what I just described for the deduping as well. We also have now a view of uh, essentially the life cycle of an auction session. So from the auction to the resulting impression to the mid event, to the end event, the click event, the conversion event, and so on, all of them are associated with the same auction ID. And you can perform essentially some kind of debugging and analysis into the life cycle of a session. So this is this has proved to be very useful for other engineers and analysts as well into seeing how a particular auction uh, behaved. So given that we support this mechanism of doing arbitrary joins, we can perform this view uh, into our data. So one of the requirements that Bernardo mentioned earlier was we need to guarantee that we have consumed all the data. So the way we do that is by introducing an auditing process. Each of the ad serve machines generates some metadata. The machine metadata generated is essentially the number of events genera generated by that particular ad serve machine in a given time interval. This is sent to a centralized auditor uh, process. And the auditor process reads from the dedupe stream and generates its own set of metadata, which again is the number of events received in the HDFS cluster or grouped by machine ID for a given time interval. If the two sets of metadata are identical, all is good, all the data has made it into the cluster. If they are not, the auditor would essentially force a, tri uh, a replay of all the data from ad serve uh, from the ad serve machine into the HDFS cluster. The ad serving machine would also essentially store all the um, data on local disk to enable this replay mechanism. Given that we have a deduping algorithm, uh, though we may have been missing uh, 1,000 events out of uh, 10,000 events in a particular ad serve machine, we replay all of the 10,000 events, we would uh, filter out all the, all the events that have already previously made it, and we would essentially emit only the 1,000 events that have not made it into the dedupe stream. So this is, again, important given our business is based on impressions and duplicate impressions, which were not, uh, duplicate impressions can create problems for our financial computations. So as a result of all this, we have a system now which uh, provides a lot of what I've just sp spoken about, what Bernardo has spoken about, and which scales linea linearly. It's highly available within a data center because of how Hadoop is built. It's highly available across data centers by uh, we, we can switch traffic from one data center to the other, uh, even if there's a DC level shutdown. And we can easily onboard new computations, whether it is joins or similar simple counts and so on. And we can provide guarantees on the consumption of data, that all the data has made it into the pipeline and has been processed and so on. So going into what uh, we have for the future, we are planning to move to HBase 98. We are currently on 94. Um, and 1x if it comes out, uh, you know, based on when it comes out. Uh, further improvements to the deduplication algorithm. And then we want to have more dynamic definition of the join semantics. We currently have it all specified in a config file. So we may have something more dynamic. And then potentially use HDFS federation to allow more isolation and separation of concerns for different kinds of data. Uh, that kind of is it uh, for our presentation. Questions? Bernardo, you want to come up here? I'm coming. So if anybody have any questions, just raise your hand, please. Um, since timing is such an important part of your algorithms, how do you maintain consistency of timing and handle latency issues near boundaries? Uh, what do you mean consistency of timing? I'm unclear of that. Mm -hmm. You've got multiple paths going to um, your H base yep. with the originating data sometimes taking you know, 100 milliseconds, sometimes taking longer, yep. sometimes taking shorter. So which group of two minute files do they go into and how do you ensure that it's based on the originating timestamp when it's near a boundary and yeah. so on? In terms of time consistency, we um, in, in the way we have used the time-based markers, we always account for a max clock skew of five seconds between servers, and we have alerting if it goes beyond a second and so on. But uh, we essentially, when we store the time-based markers, the start time and end time, we always decrement the time by five seconds to ensure you know, we, can, we don't miss any data because of clock skew. Does that make sense? Yes. Any other questions? Yeah.
You mentioned you're using Flume and G. Are these just log files you're moving? If so, so what source are you using? Are you using a spooling directory source? Are you using a tail-f at sec? What are you doing? Um, we're using a uh, netcat source. That's all our ad-serving machines just write to the socket. And for the whole replay mechanism that we talked about with the auditor, we use the spool directory source for that. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? Um, in your Roki, you have uh, salt prefix, right? So what sort of um, uh, scan criteria are you using to, you know, uh, it's one way you're reducing your skewness in the source data being ingested, but uh, for query performance, the scan, read paths. Mm -hmm. uh, did you see any challenges in that? Uh, with the, uh, by able to generate the salt and, you know. So the salt is a hash of the event ID. Hash the of the event ID. Yes. yes. Uh, okay. And we, um, we don't necessarily query all possible salt values. Okay. We've divided our data into chunks, okay. all of which have the same salt, and then we issue the historical scan, which is start row end row based, based on the boundaries of the chunks. Anything um, on uh, uh, the encoding on the disks and so forth? No, um, we did not use like prefix encoding and so on. It's Nothing not like that? No. Oh, okay. Thank you, everyone. That's the end of our session.